I now found directions from series. Oh yeah? I'm so good. so let's see. Grandpa. Today is Sunday, July twenty seventh, I believe, two thousand fourteen. Here at thirty nine South Pueblo Street <laughs> with the Grandpa Albert. Gilbert Arizona. Gilbert, Gilbert, Arizona with uh, Gilbert uh, Grandpa Carol. Albert Carroll, Janet Carroll, Litster, David, Albert Carroll, and Eric Albert Litster. So, I was in town for Lake Powell, the Litster fam family trip to Lake Powell, <laughs> and uh, stopped by to see Grandpa Albert and wanted to ask him some questions about um, what, what life was like for my mom growing up and for her kids growing up. and kind of memories that Grandpa Albert has of, of my mom and her siblings. So, take it away. You're going to have to ask some questions. Right? Yeah, so let me think, I'm going to apply here. So, my mom was born in Emmett. What was Emmett like when my mom and siblings were born? And what brought you guys to Emmett? Was M at three thousand when we were high for five thousand. Anyway, Emmett was never bigger than five thousand people when we lived in Emmett. And what brought us to Emmett was we had lived in southern Utah and Dad wanted to uh, get on a farm so he could work us boys and also in Arterville, nearly everyone was related, so he wanted to get where he could find some people or kids to marry that were not related. Uh -huh. But anyway, we owned a mercantile store that did in Arterville. It was one that had been used in the United Arter, and he inherited it from, my dad inherited it from his dad, Frederick Carroll, that's how come he had the, the store. And we moved from Arterville in 1945. And dad had gone up previously to Idaho to look for land. He went in eastern Idaho around, well, anyway, it was eastern Idaho, and it was too windy, <laughs> too cold there, so he went into western Idaho, and he liked the climate there much better. Emmett is only about 2,000 feet, so it was quite well. Had the seasons, and didn't get extreme cold, got cold but not extreme. So he bought a farm there in at least Morgan Park for 80 acres. And I was thinking it was $20,000, huh. which we ended up getting, selling the store and having enough to pay for the farm. Anyway, we, in 45, we, we drove up there. David, our dad's brother had a big cattle truck, so he loaded everything up in it and hauled our belongings up there. So that's how we got to, to Emmett, Idaho. And how many kids were in your family? So your dad and your mom and all your siblings went to Emmett from Orville. Was Charlene born in? Was it Margaret and Clara May born in Emmett? I was thinking Martha Claire May was born in Panguish because she was a blue baby. Okay. And I think with Margaret would have been born. Do you remember David Margaret? I'm thinking she was born in Emmett. Okay, I kind of think that too. But. So there was four total after all born. There was four boys and four girls. Okay. Siblings. And you, how old were you in 45 when you moved to Emmett? I went my junior year at Valley High School and went my senior year 
in Emmett. So you graduated, you graduated high school from Emmett High? After one year. After one year, okay. And I never did fail. It was my school. I never did go to any of the unions yeah. from Emmett, but I did end up going to some in Valley High Orderville. Good. Family or high school reunion. And did much family stay in Orderville? Like your dad's, you, your dad and your family, immediate family, left. R Rulin and Elsie left. Rulin and Elsie, okay. And our siblings, that's how it went up. How many stayed? Like how many of your uncles and aunts stayed in Orderville? Well, I had Uncle Henry and Aunt Minnie and Aunt Margaret that lived in Phoenix, Arizona at the time, and that was. And had a lot of cousins. Gotcha. Stayed in. Okay. And so that's how you guys got to Emma, got the farm. And so did you, after you, I know that you went to Utah State, I believe. Is that right? Before Utah State, I went into the military for 18 months, spent 15 months in Japan. And then after I got off my military service, I went on my mission, Central States Mission. And what states did you serve in? Central States, Missouri and Kansas. Missouri and Canada? Kansas. Oh, Kansas, okay. So Missouri and Kansas. So Gosh. I didn't go to college till after I finished military and my mission. Okay. And what's interesting, and Military, even though I was in for 18 months, the GI Bill paid for all my tuitions and books. And it also saved money that my military saved, paid for my mission. So the pay he got from being in the military, he saved it and went on a mission with that money. You gotcha. And then he got the GI Bill and had four years of tuition and books. That's great. From working 18 months. <laughs> and earn my board and earn my board and room. I worked at the college cafeteria about four hours after a day. I paid 55 cents an hour then. 55 cents an hour. That's so what. And Albert's uh, military time was after the bombs were dropped and there was the war was over. Dad was there doing an office job during the reconstruction, and it was a nine to five job. And after being a farm boy. He thought a nine-to-five job was a cushy, cushy life. So he did not see any. He did do uh, basic training, boot camp for three months. You did training. Well, I did it in when I went into the service. We left Boise, went to Salt Lake, and from Salt Lake went to Fort Lewis, Washington, and did seven weeks of basic training. Where else did I go? Oh, Fort Bragg. I did four, seven weeks of basic training. What state is Fort Bragg in? I North Carolina. North Carolina? So was, was that when you tried out for the Army Band? That would have been in Japan. Okay. Well, I, well I, I think it was Japan. But we, we wouldn't settle down enough to do anything like that. But anyway, I was supposed to have 13 weeks of basic training, so in the States I got two seven weeks and from Fort Bragg, North Carolina they shipped me all the way to Camp Stone in California all the way across the states. To by train? It would be by train then. Oh. And uh, Camp Stone is the point where I was shipped overseas to Japan. On a ship? By ship. How long did that take? We broke a record of the ship I was on. It took eight days on the Pacific. Wow, that's, that's hard. And what's interesting, I went to bed Christmas Eve and woke up the next day. It was the day after Christmas. We'd cross, cross the international date line. Oh, yeah. Christmas you were chipped at Christmas. <laughs> I missed Christmas. Missed Christmas. <laughs> I did have a little gift to give us. The, that's good. Uh, the day after Christmas. But land in Yokohama which is near Japan, and I was shipped from... Is, that, is it Okinawa? No, Yokohama. Yokohama. Oh, is he, that's near Tokyo, or...? He's near 
That's where it shipped off. Near Tokyo, okay. It was near Tokyo. Then we shipped all to the most southern island of Kyushu in a town called Kumamoto. And I was in the 21st Infantry Division Regiment. And then it's in a regiment. I forgot the regiment number. Uh -huh. Anyway, the division higher up, 34, th anyway. So I was in southern Japan on the island of Kyushu. That was 750 miles south of Tokyo. So going down, I went through the town of Hiroshima on, just from the train. I, if it didn't stop, I could see the damage yeah. of the bomb. What did it look like? Just complete destruction. There's big cement. Foundations are made out of cement. It's all that's left with the foundation of the wall or cement walls. Yeah. Steel tops. Buildings were bent. I saw also went to, what's the name of that one in southern? Um, the other bombs. Hiroshima. Hiro Hiroshima and Nagasaki. 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 I got to go there for, while I was in, on the base. It was about, oh, maybe, I'm not sure. An hour or so, train ride. I went alone by myself. I wasn't going to go with my friend Howard, who joined the army with me and Emmett. But he ended up couldn't go, and so I went by myself and spent the whole day walking around seeing the ruins. And a little concerned being just a year after the war was over. So it was still radioactive? It could have been. And just, uh, but I did run into a school teacher whose face had been disfigured by the bomb. He could speak English. And so I visited a little with him, but I, just by myself, I walked around and looked through the ones, spent the day there. I took with me some LDS literature that I had printed and just left some of it around. Yeah. But Dad made his own missionary tracks. But anyway, the, nice. I, I wrote the Salt Lake to Tokyo, and the mission is so new there. The headquarters. They didn't have any any literature to send me, so I just mimographed some up myself and distributed it from that time, unless I'm on a base. Anyway, that some books are Mormon. Yeah. And I left in the library when I left it. And after I left, I got a letter from someone that had gotten a hold of the Book of Mormon in the library. And I don't remember his name, but anyway, I corresponded back to him, and the letter was returned. My unit that I left in Japan was the first ones into Korea soon after I left, and I just assumed he had been gone to the Korean War and was killed. I knew some of the people I knew in Japan. And were killed that I knew. Somehow how I learned, I don't know. But anyway, I never did have any further correspondence with him about the Book of Mormon. Yeah. But if I'd have been, when I left the military, I was a T4, Deck 4, which was equivalent to a, an, a sergeant. And most of them, a lot of them, signed up to reserve their ranking. I chose not to. And had I chose to stay in the reserve, I'd have been called right back to the Korean War. So that's how close I got to wow. being sent over there. But so, I enjoyed the military. I said I had an office job that was just like a civilian job. And what made it even better to get all, all, all the practice the noise of getting up in the morning. I'd get up a little bit earlier and would go up to the college and 
study or do things up there. I got permission to do that. Mm. Did you take some college classes while you were there? I took, yes. I got uh, actually my English 101 that you have to take when you go to college. I took that in Japan so I didn't have to retake it when I went to Utah State. Was it a correspondence course or mm. was it a classroom? A classroom. And I also took a, a, a dairy. I should have taken more levels that would have got college credit. I didn't realize, I guess, at the time. But I got at least two classes there that went towards credit. And also, I think being in the military gave me six credits, or 15 credits, when I went in Utah State. What was the reaction like that when you were out, not when you were off the base talking to like the Japanese? What was their reaction towards America? And what's, towards what's interesting? I never did go off base, except one or two trips. Okay. I could have done. I didn't. We had a lot of Japanese working on base, doing repairs and things like that. I remember, all they had to eat was rice. Rice, rice, and a lot of them were scavenger or uh, throwaway food. Mm -hmm. That the Japanese people ate? That they would eat. Because they were very starved. But in, in, um, in Japan they had a small LDS group. At one time, it was around 15, and when I left, there was hardly any. They had all gone home. I remember periods of time why they were, as far as the church is concerned, I was in charge of, one of the things I was in charge of was the Farm 20, which had on one sheet both back and all, all the information you could think of about the, yeah, soldier that anyway it had in our church preference and if we were listed Mormon when we had going to church we some of them didn't show up at church we would go look them up mm -hmm. I remember going around and trying to get them active in our little group that's good did you have a mission conference or a military church conference? Our church group at the time a major ranking of a major was in charge of the group. And in Tokyo they're going to have a big LDS conference. And he got permission to let us get us off the base to go up to Tokyo. So I, while Lara took that 1,500 mile round trip by train, that was the second time, I, third, fourth time I went through Hiroshima, the time I went back home. So, anyway, all I remember of that is that I had a group of quite a number of little children singing the song, Jesus, I'll Be a Sunbeam for Jesus. They sang it in Japanese. That's the only thing I remember of the conference. That's great. And one other field trip we took, church group we took, was to the, an active volcano, Mount Oslo. And it was active enough that they were shooting up boulders and stuff out of the volcano. We could get quite close to it. Wow. I think that's the only two things we did as a church group. And so were you just in the in the middle, so that you got drafted or did you volunteer? I volunteered. Okay. Dad had a friend in a high school friend named Howard Holman. And he had signed up. Uh, he had signed up and so he sent the dad was at Rolling Hills Apples Orchard picking apples in the fall after he graduated from high school. And the recruiter came to the orchard and recruited Dad. Two, two recruiters came and dad was 
and I were picking apples. And after the, they give their talk, split, or whatever you want to call it, I asked Dad, what do you think? They had to explain the GI Bill and some of the benefits. Mm -hmm. I could go in for just 18 months. And Dad said, that sounds pretty good to me. So yeah. right on the spot, we, we decided we'd join the Army in two or three days. We'd left. I left. Oh, it was that fast. <laughs> Now this Howard Holman who sent the recruiters to Dad, who was Dad's high school friend, they were in Japan together, and then when they got out of the military together, Dad went on a mission, and what did, did Howard just work? He must, I don't know what he Well, did. Dad, and then after the military, Howard got baptized? Oh, you told me that. I'm not remember. sure whether it was after. During your mission or when you came home from your mission? I don't remember exactly. Anyway, this Howard friend ended up joining the church. He's the only one in his family that got baptized. And then when uh, Albert and the other Kara boys went to Utah State to college, Howard wanted didn't want to be left behind, so he went to? So after my mission, Howard and I went to Utah State, and we went there with all the time together. And that's where Howard met his wife, and he got married in the temple? Yes. He, his, his wife was still in high school, wasn't she? Yes. <laughs> we met her. She's still alive. Anyway, so ha the Holmans and Dad have been friends. Well, I first met Howard in a speech class in high school. Emmett High School. In my last year of Emmett, the only year of Emmett. Yeah. And we just got to be friends. And he was what got me into the army. And so, uh, did he serve in Japan or for military service? Was he just doing the recruiting? No, they were served together. They both were army guys. Oh, you both were you guys in Japan together? Yes. Okay. Went over together and home together. They signed up together, basically. Gotcha. So you did the same trainings together in Washington and then North Carolina and then California and yeah. off to Japan on your eight and day And when cruise. he got in there, he... He became a sergeant giving orders to people. What had happened in Japan, they did 17 weeks of basic training over and over and over. And had I not gone into the office, well, what's interesting, I never did get past seven weeks. I took seven weeks of basic training, so there's three places I took seven weeks and never did complete the 13 weeks of Army basic, which is required. So. You took the first 17 weeks three Se times. Se first seven, seven weeks. First seven. Uh, 13. Three times. I should have had 13 to complete the program. And when I was in Japan, I got called to the office. Because uh, Albert knew how to type. In my Form 20, you list how fast you could type. Oh, yeah. And in high school, I took four years of typing. I take it up, type the girls. So it looked pretty good on my form 20. How fast could you type back then? Do you remember your words per minute? Well, at least 60, 62. Yeah. I could do two or three minutes without any mistakes. That's impressive. If you make mistakes, it would cut down the... It was over 60, but it wasn't the fastest, but it was still among the best. Yeah. So that got me my good army job. It's, it was the last part? What did you say? He got him his good army job. Oh, gotcha, yeah, in, in the office. Basically, he was a typist in the office. Well, what's interesting, besides my regular assignments, I had officers coming to me to type up things for them. Personal letters, even. Oh, yeah. Things like that, so. They knew I could type and willing to do it, so. Good. What did Howard do? He was a drill sergeant. Oh, yeah? <laughs> I, I would never have been good at that anyway, so. Yeah, it takes a different person to be a drill sergeant. And then later in life, Howard got into construction, and didn't he work for the church for a while, building chapels? And yeah, stuff he in built California? institutes and chapels, and actually in charge of the buildings he was building. And when he settled down in Orem, he became a building was it building inspector for the city of Orem? Yes. 
Oh. So he had a good job. Okay. Howard's oldest daughter, Vanita, came. We were still in the old house, so it was under my seventh grade year. But she came for a week. Her, she had grandparents in Emmett, Howard's parents, but they weren't members, so she spent time with us. And Was it a couple weeks? How long was Vanita with us? I don't remember. Anyway, so we could take her to church. And she, she spent uh, part, of the, part of the two weeks or week with our family and part with her grand, non-member grandparents in Emmett. I just remember that. I remember she gave us a um, picnic basket as a thank you gift for hosting her, and my and Joanne would keep her knitting in that picnic basket. Oh. Do you remember that, David? I remember the picnic basket. Did you remember where it came from? No, I had no clue. I remember we visited the Holmans in Southern California when we went to Disneyland. And they lived basically in the middle of an orange grove. And so I woke up the next morning and asked if I would get in trouble, if it would be alright if I picked an orange off the tree and they laughed and you can eat all you want. <laughs> <laughs> and, they, and they showed us a cocktail tree that had been grafted in with oranges, grapefruit, lemons, and limes. Or at least three things on the tree growing, just branches that had been grafted in. Yeah. So, do you remember going to Disneyland? Was that a family trip? I remember Disneyland. I was eight, I turned eight years old at Disneyland, but I don't remember the the cocktail tree. I don't remember visit. I know we visited everybody we knew <laughs> between California. California, Utah, and Idaho. And that trip. <laughs> but I don't remember visiting the Holmans. But I remember visiting other people. Would would, would have been that trip we visited Francis Bingham and his wife, the one that lived in Morgan. No, because I was a, I was like a toddler in those pictures. Okay, it's a different trip. Yeah, I was I turned eight years old on that trip. David was twelve. David won the trip from uh, selling subscriptions to the Messenger Index, our weekly uh, town paper, and so we spent two weeks. It was driving to Utah, spent a couple days in Disneyland, and saw all the sights in California. I remember how nervous mom and dad was. Driving in California. What were you nervous about? And all that traffic. Yeah. I can't remember how old we were when we visited Tijuana. But we, you know, we it was that trip. It was that trip. We, we parked in the States, <laughs> walked over into Tijuana. We and, walked across the border. And some guy had this like giant overcoat, like a London fog coat, with little pockets or space. They like maybe a hundred watches on him inside his overcoat. It's like in the movies. And, and he tried to sell one to Grandpa, and Grandpa figured they were stolen, and he refused to, to buy one. The guy kept dropping her price, kept dropping her price. He said, Mister, I give you a watch for free. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a good salesman. <laughs> I give you one for free. <laughs> and Grandpa wouldn't take it for free. <laughs> and then Mom had bought some kind of a straw hat that had a little... Um, Kind of little strings going down maybe half an inch or an inch and then like a grape sized ball on it all the way around. And when you came back into the States there's two lines, one for gringos and one for the Mexicans. And she was in the gringo line. I think the guy must have been joking with her. So, lady, you need to get in the, in the Mexican line. Because she, she was all, wearing a Mexican hat. She got all excited. <laughs> we only spent a couple hours. Mom didn't dare drive in Tijuana. Because she was afraid that someone would make us get her in a wreck and put us in jail. She was very, very... But very we cautious. walked across. It was like, I remember, it was a dump. We walked across a bridge, and there was a dump. And there was a donkey that had put stripes painted on to look like a zebra eating the garbage in the dump. No way. That's how we got into Tijuana, was walking over a bridge over a dump. Can I remember that? Do you remember that, that, Albert? Do you, David? Oh, yes. I remember the, the watch salesman and mom being told to get in the Mexican line. Grandpa, do you have any other memories of going to Tijuana on no. your short trip there? Jolene had to stay home, didn't she? She was a baby. I think so. I think Jolene had to stay home because she was a baby. And then when Jolene was 12, she, won, she, she and mom won the contest again driving around town all over the county 
selling subscriptions to the the weekly newspaper and Jolene won the same trip when she was 12 years old and we went to Disneyland again a second time with her. We didn't her. do that until we moved down here. But we didn't take the trip till we moved down here? Oh, ah, we she won the trip. She was in she was in ninth grade when we she won, we won three three times a Disney. Three times? I only knew two times. Who else won? I don't remember. Was it James? Either. I know one time we thought maybe it'd be too late to take advantage of the to cash in the prize. We've been down here and they accepted it on the other hand. So. I thought once we went to California uh, with Jolene, we did Disneyland with Jolene because she was t maybe David was gone to college or something or a mission. I remember going twice to Disneyland from Idaho. Yeah. So, Dad, working with your brothers, how harmonious or how difficult was that? Being in a business with, there were four brothers and Grandpa Rulin. The brothers were Albert, Donald, Clarence, and Charlie. Charlie. And the four brothers started out with a. What were you, what was your first your first farming adventures? Did you have cows at first or chickens right off? Started up? cows, then went into chickens. We we got the routes to do the chickens, and we bought close to twenty thousand chickens we had at one time. That seemed too high. There anyway, was a whole bunch of chicken coops. Anyway, we ended up buying truckloads of eggs, and at the end, these huge trucks, and we would run them through our. Oh, and, we had to clean them and grade them, and. Probably not clean them, but just repackage them into our containers. We packaged them into and our candle, containers. Cattle come to make sure they were good. We candled them. We went over from there. Candling was this black curtain with lights, and you'd have to sit and watch on a conveyor belt, one egg at a time. They would look at them to make sure they were okay. Thanks. There's no blood. Spot. No blood spots. I was just a young child when we had that egg, and they, the conveyor belt would go down, and it would measure the egg. I don't know if it was by size or by weight, but there were th small, medium, and large eggs, and it would go, and this machine would make the eggs go small, medium, or large, and then would package them in the in the in the dozen packages in the different sizes. And so these are eggs are from your twenty thousand chickens. Our twenty thousand chickens, and then at the end, they found it was cheaper to buy eggs from California and ship them up than it was for us to have our own chickens. And I have a memory as a, as a school-aged child. It was at night because at night the chickens were roost. It's when they were going to butcher all the chickens. And at night we grabbed the chickens, their legs, while they were roosting and shoved them in these cages. And then they took this truckload of chickens several different nights over to uh, either Nampa or Caldwell where they had a, uh, they canned them up. We had canned chickens, so we ate those chickens. Do you remember that? And they also sold a lot of them at that. Sold a lot of them live or dead? Well, I think when we, when we had all the chickens, we had a lot of calls when they quit laying. Remember sometimes they'd have a sale, you know, you buy two dozen eggs, you get a free stewing hen. Oh, really? So they got to catch one and had it to the So people. they sold, uh, Grandma Elsie had a little little store out in the shop in, behind her back, back door, across her backyard was a little shop, and she would sell eggs and milk, people would come in. But So you would also ship the eggs all over, did you, I don't remember, I remember driving milk to Boise, but I don't remember you driving eggs anywhere. I didn't, that was Charles' job. Deliver the eggs. He would deliver it to all the stores around? Up to McCall and had that route up there. Boise. Boise. Boise and McCall, he'd deliver eggs to all the grocery stores, restaurants. restaurants. 
Uh, so you so it was determined that it was cheaper just to buy the eggs, not to have the chickens. So that's when you slaughter the chickens and slow those off. And then we had all these chicken coops made out of wood. I remember when they built them, the members were laughing, saying, oh, you're building housing, because they look like ranch houses. You're building housing for the uh, 12 tribes of Israel. We're going to come, come out of the north and come live in these ranch houses. Do you remember that, David? No. Anyway, they were painted white. They were made out of wood, sawdust. They weren't like in cages like they are now. They were like these different coops. This is John. Is it? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Jonathan. Happy birthday to you. Jonathan, how young are you? How young are you? 27. I am 27 years young. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Carol Ann turns 27 in a couple months, too. Yeah. Well, so, but for me, it's my golden year. Oh, because it's 27 so, on the 27th. Nice. Oh, it's your magical golden, it's a golden year. year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Why? Yeah. I have a it is. You guys are still down there? Yeah, so I was at Lake Powell for the week. Just got back last night, and so my flight is out um, tomorrow, uh, tonight at 8.30. Wow, where did, where did it go? I know. And I fly out at 5. Huh? I fly out at 5. I've been here a whole week. Okay, okay. We've been we in Arizona heat? Yeah, we, we love the Arizona heat. <laughs> Jan has been decluttering our house. It's sure been good to get rid of things that we don't use. <laughs> I am making Albert and David so nervous of me throwing and getting things put away. The carport's have clean. You, have either of you seen the movie Grumpy Old Men? <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time. Should I see it again? I know. Yeah, I mean, it's not that they're grumpy, but Dad and Grandpa could sure use a I'm sure you the ladies touch decluttering all the, the stuff we've collected, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> McKaylee and Holly were out last night. Some months ago, I tied a rope around Paley so she would have a tiger tail. And so McKaylee and Holly decided they wanted to go around with tiger tails. So I had a rope tied around each of their waist. And love you, Juan. Thanks. Love you guys. It was good to talk to Eric and Janet. Okay, bye-bye. Hey, bye. You too. bye. bye. Yeah. Oh, probably not. <laughs> so that they have late church. Yeah, they have noon church, and yeah. I didn't remember the church. I thought maybe they're going to a school. Uh, regular church. Well, just a, yeah, just a regular ward. A family ward, not not a not, not even a, like not a, a married student, 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 student married. And they just got a call about a week or so ago to work in the primary tag team teach. How fun. They're going to be eight-year-olds. That's a fun age. That is a fun <laughs> age. Very, yeah. Just baptized. Did you turn your recorder off? I turned it off. I turned it back on. So I paused it during the middle of the conversation with Jonathan. I want to catch the singing part. <laughs> So, let's see, where were we? First we were, you, had a, about, you had a small dairy, and then we were talking about the poultry. I guess that was the dynamic. Going through the, the de-junking I did this weekend, <laughs> I went through one of David's treasure boxes, and he, has, he had a bunch of copies of his autobiography that he wrote in the 8th grade. Of your autobiography? That was and I time. learned that... I, I know the property that was called the Lower 40, that they would, they would herd the cows to and from for twice a day milking from the Lower 40. It was a good half mile or three quarter of a mile, wasn't it, from the Kitty, Lower... Kitty Carter dog property. It's half a mile, maybe? At least half a mile. At least one half one. a mile. They would herd, <clears throat> they pastured the dairy cows and then they would herd them to get milk. How many cows did you have? 
How many did you? And that was the old barn where they would put these electric beckles on. You have to, did you sit on a stool and have to hook up these milkers? You only, how many did you have at one time? Three? I remember watching you milk cows in the old, the old barn. And the, the you know, the cows were stanchioned while they were being milked. And when they were just about being through milk, we'd get on their backs and would ride them as they walked out of the barn and then we'd kind of hang on to the top of the doorway and slide off of them until we weren't riding them out in the open corral. You know, the, the, the old ones that would let us do it. Yeah. But anyway, we started out when we bought the farm. I think there's only had, the owner only had 15 Jersey cows and we purchased another Jersey herd of about 10. And it's just hard to raise Jersey calves and build. We wanted to build up to so all four of us brothers and dad would have an income. So we just gradually build up more and more with the dairy cows. We switched from Jerseys to, to Holsteins. At one time we bought from Wisconsin a hundred young, very young baby calves. And then we bought later a hundred or so Springer. And are Springers already bred? Yeah, they were about ready to have a calf. Oh, a Springer is a pregnant, Spartan. pregnant cow. But anyway, we got built up. I would guess what three hundred, be a little high number. I think we had at one time three hundred fifty in the milking string. Three hundred fifty milking cows. Plus some in dry cows. That doesn't count the dry cows and the pregnant cows. No, the calf we were raising up. Or the calves. Anyway, we ended up early building a new dairy barn on the on the 40 that Joanne and I lived on, which made it possible to milk numerous more cows. But anyway, in addition to the dairy, and we quite quickly went into the poultry business also to help provide for the four sons and dad income. Now, Grandpa Albert got training to do artificial insemination for the cows. What, at what, how early on did you do that? I always remembered you doing it. I don't remember. Was David, did you do it before David was born or? It would have been a little later, I'm sure. How long did you have to go to, for training? I went up to Moscow, Idaho. The, I was going to work for, for Cache Valley Breeding, and one of their representatives drove me up by. Anyway, I had just a week's training, is all I needed to artificially inseminate our cows. It had been somewhat later. And then later on, I, all of Gem County, I do the breeding for the dairymen that wanted it, our services in in the Jim County, and some of them were quite long trips. I remember as a, a young, uh, el maybe it was preschool, uh, going with my dad as he'd drive all over the county, and uh, the farmers would uh, corral up their their cows that they wanted bred, and Dad would breed. They, I just remember it was. Um, it's about a yard, oh, smaller than a yard, bigger than a bread basket, cylinder, stainless steel tank that had dry ice in it. And they had these long, uh, maybe had, foot had, long. Had, had liquid nitrogen. Oh, liquid nitrogen yeah, to keep early, it cold. Earlier we had just dry, or just ice. Oh, was it? Okay. And then we went to not liquid nitrogen. So the cylinder tank that you could carry around if you're a strong man, and they had, uh, Vi a little glass of vials on long sticks, metal sticks inside this nitrogen tank and the farmer would look at the book and see what bull they wanted their cow to be bred to and would they order ahead of time? They could, but they wouldn't. We carry quite a variety. So, so the inventory, the, the, the bull semen was inventory was 
I just remember there was a book and they could, it, it was a picture book. It had a picture of the bull. It's like a mail order bride. Mail right. Order of, the, of the sperm semen, whatever, in these little vials. Anyway, that's I mean, what I grew up, what, going, driving around with my dad all over the county. That cylinder tank she talked about sit in the vehicle. It was too heavy to carry around. To, it just sat in Oh, it sat pot, in the, oh. In her guilt of that to pick out liquid nitrogen. So funny. That's like space sperm. age stuff. No, I mean it's like sperm donors today for human beings. It's like <laughs> take out the book of what kind of man do you want your <laughs> exactly what kind of like, like quite, quite, quite often if it was going to be the cow's first calf, they would select a bull that was known to throw a a fairly small calf, so it'd be easier on the first birth experience of the cow. Oh wow! So that might milk, have been a consideration. Milk high fat or low fat milk, you could choose. <sighs> What was the success rate on that? What was the pregnancy success rate? I don't know, but it's it, pretty good. Pretty good. Yeah. I didn't have to pay for the semen until I used it, and if we, if they paid for the first one, I think it was seven fifty, and after that they were free if we had to rebreed them. Okay. And so I just had to pay the one one time. So I have quite an inventory, but I didn't pay for it until I used it. Gotcha, yeah. So with me growing up, we never had, we had all those cows, but we never had bulls. When the babies, when the baby calves were born, if they were bulls, they went up to Grandma Elsie and Ruland's house, and we fed them. Well, first you milk fed them, and then we, until they got like a truck full for, or a little corral full, and they'd truck them off and... We'd sell all the little bull calves. At times we'd raise them out to sell them as young beef animals. But we sold a lot of day old calves to the sale yard. I remember as a very young child that we did have some bulls. We'd come home from church and a bull would be loose in the yard. So Grandpa Albert would grab a pitchfork and try to chase it back into the corral. See, I don't remember any full-size bulls. But I didn't enjoy working about bulls. I mean, they're dangerous, and I think I was scared of them. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. So you had the, the poultry side and the dairy side at the same time. Yes. The dairy, we, uh, the Albert and Joanne Carroll family lived where the dairy was. The poultry was up by Rulin and Elsie's ha uh, property, and Don's house was right next to the poultry, uh, Grandma and Grandpa Elsie and Rulin's house. Okay. So it was like a half a mile walk or a three quarter mile walk to the from, from, from our house, Albert and Joanne's house to Grandma and Grandpa and Don and Rita's house was half an hour, half, half a mile, three quarter mile. Couple farmhouses between there. Yeah. But quite early in the, on the farm we started jugging our milk and selling it as raw milk. We did deliveries to the stores and then Metal Gold in, in Boise we made weekly, two weeks, twice a week. I think it was twice a week. Delivered. So as a teenager, we delivered milk, dad would deliver milk gallons to Boise. So I would go with him often because I would go shopping in downtown Boise uh, while he did the delivery and did, he took his time so I could do some more shopping. When I found fashion, I would hitch a ride on the milk truck to Boise. <laughs> do you remember that, dad? And in Emmett, we had... Albertsons and another store. We had Shamrock, Albertsons, and Foodland. And we delivered milk to That we delivered gallons to. And all the rest of the milk, and, and, and we sold some at the little store at Grandma Elsie's we house. We sold quite a bit. People would come to the, to the farm and pick up milk too, raw milk, eggs. See, Grandma Elsie had this till, and she'd bring it in the house every night. Uh, we never locked anything. And I remember when it was our birthday, She'd say, go, go get a dollar out of the till, and we'd get our dollar. But sometimes we were evil and wicked, 
and we would steal quarters and ride our bikes to the store a couple miles away and buy candy bars and soda pop. <laughs> <laughs> that was my life of crime. <laughs> Still from your grandma. <laughs> also, my dad had 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 these tumblers with his loose change in, and we'd steal money from there and buy our candy bars and soda pop. <laughs> we didn't do it every day. It was a long bicycle ride. <laughs> yeah, it's a trick to the store. <laughs> Yeah, it was like big ahead of what, what, what you want to steal. And there were and there were cup there were two sets of heels up and down. It was work. <laughs> so we didn't do it a lot. <laughs> I, I think it was the summer between fourth and fifth grade, my cousin Rex, Uncle Don's son, and I were playing with some boards and planks, just kind of nailing them together. And Uncle uh, in, in the pasture above Ruler and Elsie's place, Uncle Don came over and showed us how that if you had a bottom plate and a top plate and boards nailed in between, you could make a floor. Same thing for the walls and same things for the roof. So we built a two-story playhouse. Well, the second story was like two and a half feet tall. It was a loft. We, we roofed it with wood and wax cardboard. And then anyway, I, probably towards the end of our fifth grade year, we invited a bunch of our friends. And so there's 13 of us that went from Brick Elementary School to Shamrock Market, we bought some candy bars and soda pop and rode our bicycles to uh, the clubhouse above the grandparents' place. And about dark, we were really hungry. And we could have gone down and Grandma Elsie would have fixed anything for us, but we were ornery. And we stole a frozen stewing hen out of her freezer, out of the you know, outbuilding in a freezer there. Took it up there, poked some kind of a metal rod through it, got a fire going and proceeded to rotisserie cook this frozen... Just like hen. on TV. <laughs> and basically it'd be burnt on the outside and, and, and would peel it off where it had melted raw on the inside against the, the frozen flesh. So it was a combination of burnt and raw flesh of this hen. And that was our supper for that night. That's and then, great. after they played with it, the David and the older Rex and they and their friends they lost interest in that fort, and uh, they were pasturing some calves there, and and the, that kind of we called it the wood pile. It was in back of Grand Elsie and Roland's house. That's where they would if they tear, tore down a building. Of course, they would recycle all the wood, and there'd be piles of wood, and there were a bunch of old junk and cars, not you know, junk cars and junk farm equipment. It was kind of like the trash heap where we built this clubhouse and they but they pastured some calves there and they used that as the calf pen. And then the cousins my age a year or so later we cleaned out all the calf poop. I don't know how we, we shoveled it out and then we got water and we washed it out and so we used it as a clubhouse and then we had a couple sleepovers in it. It was, how big do you think it was? Five by eight? Yeah, something like that. And a ladder up to the second floor loft was like two or three feet high. Anyway, so we had a fun summer playing in that, but I remember we had to clean out all the cow poop, the mm. calf poop. And memories, okay. Do you remember that, Dad, at all? At all? Albert? Exactly. I remember when my kid, when, when my cousins, my and friends, my age, and or the Meyer kids, we we too got on our bikes and rode two miles to the store, up and down two sets of hills. But I remember we bought hot dogs. We didn't just buy candy and pop, but we bought hot dogs and marshmallows. And then behind Rulin and Elsie's house was this trash heap, and we built a fire where they built fires. And Grandpa Rulin decided. I mean, this is like, Grandpa Roland was a real worker. He didn't really play with us as teenagers or, pre or elementary age kids. But I remember he got out his Dutch oven and he got some potatoes out of the potato cellar and he took our hot dogs and cut them up and made us a Dutch oven potato and hot dog treat. And anyway, that was a fun memory because it was something fun uh, Roland did with, Grandpa Roland did with us that I remember. Grandpa Rulin would take time off to go fishing, so he would take us older grandkids fishing with him, and it was usually 
stream fishing. If if us younger kids weren't catching very much fish, we'd get bored and just play around and wait for him to get finished fishing. But he would fish fish the whole day, even though the fishing wasn't great. He made a day of it. Mm. Or one time we're going downstream and Steve had a, a collared short sleeve shirt and he went under this log and some air kind of in a pocket of the you know upper part of the, the shirt and we got kind of snagged on a you know tree branch across the creek and the stream was fast enough it was kind of pushing him down so he couldn't back up to unhook himself and I was right behind him and kind of unsnagged it so he didn't die he, w he wouldn't have been snagged for very long just a moment or just a few seconds but enough to remember I guess yeah I remember uh, Grandpa Rulin and a bunch of the uncles and my dad and my brothers were going on an overnight camp out fishing trip and it was boys only and I was so mad because I couldn't go too because I think James went but I couldn't go because I was a girl and I was giving them the riot rack and oh but Janet we're not going to even have plates we're going to eat our food on slices of bread you won't like it we'll be roughing it and as much as I cried and hollered, I didn't get to go. They said they'd run around naked. They didn't want to have to have a girl come because then they couldn't run around naked. <laughs> Finally, I said, okay, and I didn't press it any further. Yeah, I remember on, on several occasions, Uncle Clarence would cook potatoes and hamburger in a Dutch oven. And if we caught some fish, it kind of steamed the fish on top of the pile of potatoes and hamburger. But that's why they'd serve it, just got a a loaf of bread and hand each person a slice and take a spatula and dish out some potatoes and hamburger put it on top of the your slice of bread as you went by the Dutch oven. So they did use plates. They were true on that one. Did you guys run around naked? No. <laughs> did you go skin I mean did they go skinny dipping? They wanted to go skinny dipping. No. <laughs> did you sleep in tents or did you sleep under the stars? I don't remember. <laughs> what did they do, Albert? Probably both. I would think only not tense early on. So, uh, <laughs> but Albert would take us, our family, on um, camping trips, fishing trips. Our our stake bought some property on the in Cascade, the Cascade Lake, the reservoir, mm -hmm. and it. There was no, nobody had property right on the beach, but we were right next to the easement. And I remember when that church property, all it had was a, um, I think all it had was a hand pump, an electric socket, and an outhouse. And I remember mom came, we went camping with an electric fry pan one time because that was an improved campsite because it had electric plug. <laughs> But I remember going to like Sage Hen and That's where the best fish was. Was Sage Hen? Is that your is Cascade? It, no, Sage Hen is closer. I, Dad and I went there last uh Fourth of July weekend. It's a real pretty. We hiked around Sage Hen. Dave and I went there for Fourth of July weekend and it's at the very tip top of uh, Jim County. It's kinda of parallel to uh Cougar Mountain Lodge. Um what's it called? Uh Miss Ferry on the way up to on the way up to Cascade up way up to McCall. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. It, you, you, just west of that is a mountain. You go over that mountain, and there's a little reservoir, Sage Hen. It's really pretty in the in the pines. I gotta sneak off to it to get rid of the church. Uh, was at twelve thirty. Okay. Yeah, there. My cheerleader. I was a cheerleader. Girls sports weren't that big when I grew up, but uh, the whole, it's like the whole town came out for the boys' football games and the basketball games. and I mean, it was the whole town would come out. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was a cheerleader at Park. I went to a country middle school. Seventh grade had a basketball team where we went to town and I was a cheerleader then, and then my eighth grade year, I went to town junior high and tried out for cheerleader, and the town girls, there was a town elementary and then the other elementaries were out in the country, and when the country girls came to town, 
that all of us made cheerleader and none of the town girls made cheerleader. Oh, really? And so the town girls didn't like us very well. But I did cheerleading all from 7th grade to 12th grade. And that was my, acti my major activity in high school. And I was a good cheerleader. <laughs> I think I don't sing well now because I have dodgels on my vocal cords because I could yell out at the games. So I sacrificed <laughs> my voice for high school glory. For high school glory. We had a terrible football game team. We never won football, but we had a decent basketball team growing up in my, my years. Gotcha. Grandpa, did you go to these We football? were the Emmett Huskies. I remember as a child uh, going to town basketball games at the high school. Dad would buy family passes. And I would sit in the adult section with my dad and my mom. Mom would go too sometimes, wouldn't she? Mom and dad. It was it was like a town event. You see all the community there. And uh, going to high school games so Albert could watch the the well, boys. Was Uncle Mike Bingham played on the basketball? Oh yeah, my uncle Mike and Mark or just Mike. I remember Mike playing. I don't know about. Uncle we watched Mike. Uncle Mike Bingham play basketball and the other uh, the other Mormon boys from the two wards. They called him Bull Bingham. Bull Bingham was, was Mike Bingham? Yep. Bull Bingham. Because <laughs> Mike was a, he wasn't, he was a sturdy guy. Mark was more slim, but Uncle Mike was thicker. I don't remember watching him play, but. Well, one year Mike's team went to state. Oh, Mike's team. And I remember listening to it on the radio. State to the championship game. Is that when you started going to town games when uh, Uncle Mike was playing? I think it could have been more reason. So that was your younger brother? No, it's Joanne's. Uncle Mike. Oh. Mike Bingham. Bingham, Bingham, gotcha. Bingham, Bingham. It was Joanne's younger brother, Mike. Uncle Mike. Gotcha. So you, your mom, so Joanne's family moved to Emmett, or they were already there? Okay, Joanne's family... Because I thought they were from like Montana, and you met Utah State, and then you brought her to Emmett. No, no, no. The story is, Joanne was born in Montana. Grandpa Golden and Lenore. Grandpa Golden was an irrigation specialist for the county extension. Through... For through a college, through the land grant college. This is Joanne's dad. Yes, Joanne's dad is Golden Bingham. Gotcha. Joanne, didn't he start getting depressed in Montana? Anyway, when when Joanne, I mean, they had nine living children, and so they, when it was getting college age, they decided to move to Logan, to a college town, where there were more Mormons to date, and a college town. And when Joanne was in her first or second year of college. They moved. Golden Lenore, Golden and Lenore Bingham moved to Emmett. Grandpa, uh, Grandpa Golden was severely depressed, and they thought working on their cousin's farm in Emmett would give him an occupation and uh, help his depression. Okay. And so when, when Joanne was in college, her family moved to Idaho. So when she wanted to go home for Christmas, she found out that the Carroll boys That's were right. at Utah State. And so Joanne was going to try to find the Carroll boys to catch a ride. And uh, lo and behold, they were all in the same institute class. And so when they called Roll, she kind of saw who the Carroll boys were. And then the next day, did she come sit by you? They sat be And the next day, ne another day, she sat behind them and tapped them on the shoulder and introduced herself and asked for a ride to Emmett. Gotcha. And that's how Albert and Joanne met. Did you start dating right off from that? No, seriously, no. No, they, so that's how Albert and Joanne met. How much longer did it take for you to start dating? I don't remember. She claimed I started taking care of her pretty early. Okay, so <laughs> that next semester did you see each other? Anyway, I don't know. That was when, when he went back to school, she was living in the dorm. I was dating her seriously. Because I would go up there and they'd work out every night. And they, on the weekends, the cafeteria was not open, so 
I would take food up uh, for her and her number of friends quite regularly weekends. But that's all I really got seriously dating was they used to have to kick me out of ten every night at ten in you know, darn clothes. Okay. So you hung out with Joanne and her roommates at her dorm? How they kicked you out at 10. It's like BYU. Mm -hmm. Curfews. Okay. Going to college, I lived in town. It was probably a mile walk to the college. But I would leave early in the morning, about around 7, and then come back to my apartment until 10 o'clock. I did all my studying on campus either at the main library or at the institute library. Had my bookcase for books and carried all my books with me. So I did zero studying in my apartment. Did your brothers and Howard Holman live in the same apartment as you? Howard Holman had in the same house a year or two. My, my brothers never did live close. They went to school so much I didn't have to. Anyway, I never did live with any of my brothers. And I, I had a little apartment of my own in that house, a very small, just a room for beds, about all. So if, if jo Joanne was catching a ride home for Christmas, and were you married that next September? I would guess. We're guessing that's the timeline? And then that's, and then after you got married, did you go back to Logan for your senior year? I went. How many years did you go married? I went back two semesters. Two semesters. You went to college two semesters as a married man? I, come, I left in March. I had four, I actually had four semesters at Utah State. Oh, they were quarters. Quarters. Utah State was quarters. So I had two quarters. Of two quarters as a married man, and then you came back to Emmett? And I finished in March. I had to go back in May to my graduation. Joanne was too close to giving birth to David, so my mother went with me to my graduation. Oh. Joanne never did. So because that was May, and David was born in June. On your birthday? No, no, on, yeah, June 14th. Gotcha. Okay. Okay, so you got married in September. You went to Utah State for two quarters as a married man, finished in March, came back to Idaho, and then you w went back in May to walk during the ceremony. Yes. But... But but Joanne, your wife Joanne, did not go to graduation. She was pregnant. She was eight months pregnant with David. Yes. So Elsie went back with you. Did Rulon go to your graduation too? No. Just my mother. So it was just you and Elsie? Took a car ride, ride and you walked? Mm, graduation. And what's interesting, at graduation, at the same ceremony, President McKay's wife, was receiving an honorary degree. So after the ceremony was over, it was in the field house. We were walking around, mingling around, and I ran into, he ran into me, President McKay. Was he the prophet at that time? He stopped, he wished me well. All I remember is he's a huge man compared to me. Oh really, he's a so tall got, guy. So I got to shake his hand at, my, at that point. So. So was your mom excited? You were the firstborn getting his college degree. Did Elsie and Rulin didn't get college degrees, did they? They, my dad went to college. He's a couple years old and he never got a degree. Where did Grandpa Rulin go to college? Utah State. Utah State from Orderville. Mm -hmm. He went clear up to Logan. Mm -hmm. That's a long, a long drive. Those days. So he took several years. I mean, at least two years. Two I years think. of college. At, it was there that he, he was taking ROTC 
and they called that's when World War started. So World okay, so Rulin was taking ROTC at Utah State in Logan and that's when World War One started. Yes. And they drafted everybody that was taking military training. Mm. He'd all signed up already to leave to go overseas and the war ended. That's how close he got to having to so Grandpa Rulin was in boot camp when World War One was over. That's why we call ROTC. ROTC. Yes. So, okay. so they drafted him late in the process. late in World War One, but the war was over and he never had to go to battle. Yeah. Did he go anywhere? No. So he said he never did leave the Logan. I mean to go. So it was ROTC training at Utah State in Logan. Yes. That's the extent of his military. Time. That's how close to taking ROTC almost got me into the Korean War too, because I did take ROTC every day. They paid a dollar a day if you took ROTC, and when I graduated, I was a second lieutenant, and that nearly ever all of them were going into the military that graduated. I mean, it was, had to go, and I just told them I was needed on the farm. My brothers in military, brothers going to school, and I was needed back on the farm. So they said I wouldn't have to go if I paid them back that dollar a day. They had paid me three hundred dollars, um. and luckily I had saved it. I did. I had the money, but I didn't have to pay back the money they gave me when I went to summer camp in Virginia. So you were to summer camp in Virginia for ROTC while you were in college? Yes. Okay. So that's how close I have it. I went twice getting into the Korean War. Once, because I didn't sign up for reserve and I was able to buy myself out of the ROTC. ROTC. That's interesting that they paid you, but then you were like first to get drafted, but you... But then you become an officer. You're not. I would, if I'd have gone to, the, to to war, I'd have been a second lieutenant. Is that pretty high? Well, it's. It's better than a officer. Sign up. Yeah, better than. <laughs> yeah. Than a, what is a private? What are the? Well, a, I a starting know. army guy. There's several up in the. Uh, to be an officer was much higher ranking than any of the. Yeah. Others leading up to an officer. That the second lieutenant was. A Lowest officer, okay. So you know, like ROTC, you get trained to be an officer. And you get higher pay and higher standing if you graduate ROTC and join enlist or get your commission, I guess they call it. But luckily, they let me buy myself out. So twice, Albert almost had to be in the Korean War. <laughs> yeah, it's a good thing that you didn't sign up for the reserves. And kept your three hundred dollars <laughs> to which buy is, out which of our, is, which is a lot of money back then to buy himself out of the ROTC commitment. But luckily, I had saved every penny of it. Yeah. So I had it. If I hadn't saved it, I wouldn't have known what I'd have done. Yeah. But Howard Holman signed up with the idea, but he was actually called to go to the reserve because he had an operation. About that time, he never did have to go. His operation saved him from going into the Korea. Did you have a lot of friends die in the Korean War? I knew some that I knew in Japan did die, yes. How I learned about them, I don't know. Yeah. See, I have often felt blessed because Grandpa Rulin didn't have to serve in the Army. World War I. Dad didn't have to do World War II. Active. Active. Active, yeah. I mean, in, in the battle. Yeah, not, yeah, front lines. In the stuff. battlefield. And so, Dad missed World War II and the Korean. My husband didn't have to be in military, and so far, none of my sons have had to been real be, be soldiers in active army. I don't know how those were in active duty, how they. Went so, to we church. live. Yeah, we lived. We lived. So, you had brothers that served in active duty, and like. Clarence was two years in Okinawa, and Donna was in, I think, seven, eight, seven, nine months in eastern 
United States in with his second lieutenant. Did Clarence see active battles? So Donald and Clarence were military, were military but did not do active battles. Not, not active. Administrative or training? Well, they might have been over. They would have been over by then. Gotcha. But they were also in the military. Yeah. But Clarence spent two years. Gotcha. In Okinawa. Did Donald go? Yeah, Donald went on a mission to Rhode Island. But Clarence didn't go on a mission because he had two years in military. And he got married early. And then yeah. he married young. Aunt, Aunt, uh, Aunt Jane was between her junior and senior year when she got married in the triple wedding ceremony. So when they went to, when they went to school after uh, the triple wedding ceremony, all the boys went back to Utah State to school. Mm -hmm. Aunt Jane went and finished her high school. As she should. As she should. Are there many, were there many married people in high school back, back then? Probably more so than now because of the Army days. Gotcha. So what was it like working with your brothers? I think mommy asked that before the phone rang. Because I know like my mom, from what I hear, like, having a lot of cousins her age, she enjoyed that, and Emmett having a lot of cousins her age. But what was it like having working with your brothers and Emmett and your father? It worked very smoothly. I don't remember any big disagreements. Okay. It worked very well, but... This, having so many cousins because all four brothers living in Emmett, they had a lot of children, so there's a lot of cousins. Yeah. A Same lot of age. farm workers. <laughs> yeah. I remember my brother Steve. Um, uh, my brother Steve was a little more social at school than my brother David. And they had these Friday night dances in town at, at old furniture store called Case Furniture. Where it, 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 was a, it wasn't a furniture store anymore, but it was this big building where they would have bands and have dances. Back then they had live bands. Mm. At, the, at the dances? At dances. I mean, we didn't have good recording of stuff. Yeah. And, but the uncles would specifically assign him to milk cows Saturday mornings. He didn't know this till later. So he was if the, to to make him not want to stay up late at the dance, or he'd go to the dance and leave early, so he'd go to bed. So he so he would um, have to wake up the next morning to milk cows. So four, he didn't go out four, like four four a.m. They'd get up and milk cows. Uh -oh. So that kept my social brother from hanging out with kids and drinking beer and oh uh, yeah and getting into trouble. <laughs> and he found out later it was on purpose. Gotcha. That's a good story. So, Grandpa, do you have any stories about my mom growing up? Anything like vivid, like accomplishments, or when she was really bad, you had to give her a few spankings and stuff? Like I said, that would be the hardest subject for me to talk about. <laughs> I would tell, I remember anything about my kids when they were early, 15, 18 years old. All I remember is that she's leading experience. Yeah. She has a, a good girlfriend she was quite close to, what didn't you? Your friend, your leading buddies were good girls, friends of yours. It's one that's sweet. Yeah, Dion from Su Sweet Montour. Oh, yeah, I know Dion. I remember that, um, you know, because Dad went to all the high school games, the junior. Dad, my brother Steve played, was on varsity basketball when I was a JV cheerleader. And the, and the games were back to back. Yeah. And uh, and then Dad kept Dad would when I was in high school. Dad would go to the high school games where I cheerleaded. I mean, he wouldn't go to like my seventh, eighth, ninth. Well, ninth was JV too. I was JV cheerleader in ninth grade. Oh wow. So during my high school years, my dad would go to the games and watch me cheerlead, but he was really watching the basketball games. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. What's well, interesting, probably that carried on, but Allison, she started in junior high in sports through two years of college before she went, played two years in Missouri. I attend, David and I, I think have attended nearly every game she was in, Joanna, David and I. 
Allison. You went to Cousin Allison's volleyball games. Volleyball and Your cousin. Yeah, yeah my cousin yeah. Allison. He's a basketball and volleyball. She was a be basketball and volleyball superstar. In college, too? Yeah. Even even at college, she made a record at, at Gilbert Community. I don't know what in now, but then to her last two years, she was got invited to play for a team in Missouri. Wow. She was an excellent poppy. Yeah. Both basketball and ball. She was a starter, played nearly all the time. Yeah. That makes it more interesting when they play <laughs> all the time. Yeah, definitely. One game in her. She, her last year, she didn't go out for volleyball. She had an excellent volleyball and an excellent coach, but for some reason her and her friend got, got disliking her coach. Mm. So she purposely left the volleyball, which they thoroughly missed her and played basketball. In her senior year, she was she was the best in volleyball, too, and basketball just as good. But there was one postseason game, I think with two minutes to go, Gilbert was behind. He was playing Red Mountain, was behind seven points. Mm -hmm. and, Allison made some key shots, got fouled, and made all her free throws on that two minutes. Allison, I think, was the only one that scored. She'd had to have scored eight points. Oh, yeah? And after the game was over, the coach of the basketball team at Scottsdale Community College, which is the most popular college, community colleges, mm -hmm. and down wanted to play basketball for the Scottsdale Community College, but she refused, so. Huh. But I just remember that quite well. Yeah. Pivotal game. To do so well in two minutes, making two pointers and three or four foul shots made all of them. Yeah. So they end up winning by one point. Oh, wow. So, so game. But she was fun to watch. She was good enough. But volleyball, I think every shot she made and every time she hit the ball over the net is uh, almost to be doing it too. Yeah. But yeah. she was good. Well, that's great. I think that's something that I, you know, just there's a difference to miss out on. Because you live just down the street from, you know, David and his kids, and so they're really close to you. Yeah, it's being close. Just Two houses. Two houses across the yeah, down the street and two houses down. Off the other side of the street. And so yeah. So like they gotta grow up with you and them you know, coming over and you going to their sporting events, so Yeah, we have to walk to David's children. Yeah. <laughs> Jolene. I love Albert Carroll and Joanne Carroll and my grandparents. They gave me a great heritage. Hugs and kisses. <laughs> They're good guardian angels on the other side. And I love our children twice that, so <laughs> we really love them. Awesome. Thanks, Grandpa. Kids growing up, first 12 years on the farm, I had him about 16 hours a day. Oh, wow. So we, so we would have to go out and find him and hang out with him if we wanted so to spend time with him. Try and build up so all of us could come home to work on the farm. When Dave and Rex were around 12, that reduced the hours quite a bit because they did quite a bit of work. Yeah. Are you going to go to 1230 separate meetings? Yeah. I Are you going to do the other meetings? I think I'll come home. I'll come home too. Okay, we'll do a separate meeting with you. Yeah, sounds good. <laughs>